I am part of the Chrome Media team. Our job is to make video and audio on the web just fantastic, and we want as many sites delivering media to as many users as possible. To that end, there's been a lot of new web APIs over the last few years, especially lately for mobile media playback. And it's really exciting for us when we see sites using these APIs. For example, Forbes launched a progressive web app, and when developing their narrative for, this, for the progressive web app, they made video an integral part of the experience. iHeartRadio launched a web streaming experience, and using Media Session API and service workers, they were able to give their users the experience that they expected. And then at the beginning of this month, GeoCinema launched a PWA uh, for media playback. It's only been a few weeks, but they're already seeing 10% more session time in their PWA on average than in their native app. So there's a lot of activity going on in web media, and especially mobile web media right now. And we've seen a growth in mobile web media watch time. In fact, uh, per user media session time has increased by double digits over the last six months in Chrome on Android. So what are we going to talk about? This is the last talk of the day, and we're going to do it in three sections. The first thing I'm going to do is give you a few updates from the Chrome media team. And next, Francois is going to join us, and he's going to talk about some practical applications of media and how to get things done. And finally, the team behind the Voot.com progressive web app will talk about their PWA experience, and they're also going to talk about some new work they're doing for offline media playback. Uh, the bus icon will make a little more sense once they start talking about what they're doing, but it's really interesting because it even is providing media for users who have no internet access at all. So stick around for that part. It's a really neat application of the web. So let's start with a couple of updates. First, let's talk about autoplay. It's probably not a big secret for anybody in the room that one of the most common complaints with Chrome is when audio starts playing, and the user didn't want it, or they didn't expect it, and it is just, it's a common complaint, and frankly, it's one of the reasons that users install ad blockers. And it's also been difficult for developers, because the policies haven't always been consistent between desktop and mobile. Now, the fact is that Autoplay has a lot of great applications when users are expecting it, and so the team has been working to try to unify everything and make it easier for everybody. So, you know, looking at what's best for the user, uh, and what's best for developers, the primary goal was to unify everything across desktop and mobile. And so as we talk through these policies, these apply to both desktop and mobile to make everything as predictable as possible. On all platforms, muted media will always be allowed, including media and iframes. You can always autoplay muted media. Unmuted media will be allowed in three situations. First, if the user has already interacted with your site. And what we mean by that is a tap or a click. And when we say that, what we mean is that if they go to one page and they tap or click, and then they go to another page, on that page, the media can play with sound. Second, on desktop, if the user has interacted with the site a lot with audio, we're going to assume that audio is allowed for the site. And finally, on mobile, if the site has been added to the home screen, that's a pretty good indication that the user doesn't mind autoplay with sound. Uh, in terms of code, in, in terms of how you detect whether or not autoplay is allowed, you can do this by checking the play promise after you try to play media with audio. If the promise fails, if it's rejected, then you know that only muted autoplay is allowed. One of the things that's important to know as well is that iframes always can do muted autoplay, but the site can grant permission to access the site policy, and that's going to be done using an attribute. The attribute name is not yet finalized, but it's going to be something like gesture equals media or something like that. And so two things to know about autoplay before we move on. Uh, number one, what is the best approach? What we recommend, based on uh, our conversations with users and the work that we've been doing, is muted autoplay. Allow users to self-select into the audio, audio experience. Now, that's not going to work for every site. In some cases, click-to-play may be more applicable, but that is our recommendation in general. Uh, the other thing that we recommend doing is, because there's a lot of technical details to this, keep an eye on the autoplay policy page, the bottommost link there. That's where you'll see updates uh, as the dates and the details around things like the attributes uh, change. Next, let's talk about Shaka Player. For those of you who aren't familiar with Shaka Player, it's an open source free player that allows you to do adaptive bitrate stream fairly easily. It gives you smooth playback for video. Instagram's going to go into a little more detail about how they use Shaka tomorrow in their talk, but for now, what I'm going to talk about is things that are new in the latest release. Shaka 2.2.4 was actually just released uh, within the last 48 hours. 
Um, and it includes all of the features here. It includes support for Apple HLS for on-demand. That's with fragmented MP4. It also allows sites to customize the rendering of WebVTT and TTML. And finally, it allows offline protected media playback. That's today something you can try in Chrome on Android 62 and later. Coming soon will be Apple HLS support for live video, including support for MPEG-2 transport stream files. That's a fairly common HLS format. They're also working on adding background fetch for offline, and that's really going to round out the offline story by allowing users easier download flows. And finally, Shaka has a demo player, and the player today includes examples on how to do things like full screen and rotate, which Francois will cover, as well as they're working on adding progressive web app features to the demo to give you reference code. So those are the updates. So now let's switch over to what sites are doing today. The, the web is really great for media. You can write a great media experience once. It works on web. It works on mobile. And typically what you want is you want fast playback. You want a great UI. And you want people to be able to access it anywhere, including offline. Not everybody knows how to do that, especially on mobile. So what I'm going to do is hand it over to Francois. He spent the last six months working on articles and examples on how to give a great media experience on mobile. Thank you, John. Hello. So here's a fact. After two seconds of buffering, user starts dropping off at around 6% per second. In other words, faster playback starts means more people watching your videos. So let me walk you through two techniques you can use today on the web to accelerate your media playback on first load by actively preloading resources. First, if your video source is a unique file hosted on a web server, you can use the video preload attribute to provide a hint to the browser as to how much information or content to preload. Resource fetching, resource fetching sorry, will start only when the initial HTML document has been completely loaded and parsed, while the window load event will be fired when resource has actually been fetched. Setting the preload attribute to auto indicates that the browser may cache enough data that complete playback is possible without requiring a stop or further buffering. There are some caveats, though. As this is just a hint, the browser may completely ignore the preload attribute. When user has enabled data server, for instance, Chrome won't preload anything. And on a cellular connection, Chrome will only fetch media metadata, such as dimension, track list, duration, and so on. So here's the second technique, my personal favorite, link preload. Link preload is a declarative fetch that allows you to force the browser to make a request for a resource while the page is still downloading without blocking the window load event. Resources loaded with link preload are stored locally in the browser and are, effectively, sorry, and are effectively inert until they are explicitly referenced in the DOM, JavaScript, or CSS. So this code shows how to preload a full video on your website so that when your JavaScript asks to fetch video content, it is read from cache, as the resource may have already been cached by the browser. If the preload regressed hasn't finished yet, a regular network fetch will happen. Note that I'm using as video here in the link preload, as I'm going to use that resource as a video. If it were an audio element, I would be using as audio. So what about preloading a chunk of a video, you may ask? In that case, I would use as fetch. This is how to preload the first segment of a video with link preload and use it with media source extensions, also known as MSC. If you are not familiar with MSC, that's OK. Let's simply say that this API is what makes adaptive media streaming possible today on the web. Netflix, Twitch, and YouTube use it extensively. For the sake of simplicity, the entire video has been split into smaller files, like file 1, file 2, file 3, etc. The goal is to feed all these junk files to a video so that playback is smooth. So here's what happens. When the media source is created and ready, I'm fetching the first segment of a video that may already be in the browser cache, by the way, thanks to link preload, and appending that data to a buffer belonging to the media source of a video element. And that is pretty much it. Last thing, as link preload is not supported everywhere yet, you should detect its availability with these snippets in order to adjust your performance metrics. Now, it's not because you know how to preload content to accelerate media playback that you should do always do it no matter what. 
There are many, many signals in the web platform you can use to provide a delightful media experience to all users, including the one with limited or meter network connections. It includes the device battery, memory, network connection type, whether or not a video has a poster image, the available storage left, and whether or not data server is enabled. I have created a tiny demo page that takes advantage of all these signals at this URL. And if you're trying it now, you'll see that the video may not preload for all of you. And that's because we are all different. And beautiful, by the way. <laughs> so let's start with the first signal, the device battery. As usual now, this is a progressive enhancement. If the battery is too low and not charging, let's not assume blindly that preloading a 1080p video will make users happy. We could either lower the quality of the video, or even better, in my opinion, not preload at all. If user is on a low-end device, you may want to be kind there and not preload any media. Just wait for user to ask for it, as the device may not be able to handle everything smoothly. I assume user is on a low-end device if its device memory is less than one gig. And as you can see, it is pretty easy to get in that information. Note that a device memory HTTP header is also available in Chrome. That means if your web server knows how to handle this HTTP header, also known as client's hints header, you can serve an appropriate response resp based on the device memory. Estimating how much available space is left on the device is crucial. And if you know there's not enough to preload or store your video, you should stop right away. You may also use that information to gray out a make available offline button. That is why I recommend you always provide a way for users to clean all their stored data on your website. Now, if user is on a cellular network connection, you should assume their network data plan is not infinite, and they may even have to pay for it. So please, be mindful. Use the Network Information Web API to detect user network connection type and act accordingly. Hopefully, a dedicated metered property will be added to this API in the future to make this even more reliable. And finally, here's one way to detect in JavaScript if user has turned on the data server in Chrome. All you need is to create a video element, set the preload attribute to auto, and check that the reflected value is not none. I know it could be better, and it, it will. A save data boolean attribute is in the process of being added to the network information API. So, finger crossed. By the way, there is also a save data HTTP header also available in Chrome. So you might want to check this if your web server, if your web server supports it once again and serve an appropriate response. Now, a great media user experience relies on many progressive features. And I'm here today to tell you that the web platform is ready. And I'm really excited. Like, I am actually mean it. Let's start simple. There are a lot of cases where a user may simply want to listen to audio. And if that is a primary use case for you, you should definitely use the Media Session Web API. This API allows you to put some custom media metadata and an image in a notification accessible from the lock screen, as well as on wearable devices. It is also nice in general because users can tell what's going on on their device and easily control media playback. One cool thing I've noticed recently is that it also works with the Google Assistant on Android. User can simply say, OK, Google, pause music, or fast forward, and it just works. So let's have a look at how to use the Media Session Web API, if you will. As I said before, this is a progressive feature. So it starts with an if statement. If the browser supports it, you can provide some media metadata, like the title, artist, album, and a list of artworks. You can specify many more artwork sizes than I did in this snippet. The browser will always pick the one that is the best for the user's device. I would suggest, though, you always provide 256 and 512 pixel squared images, as they are the most common ones on Android. Once you've provided some metadata, you may also want to respond to the media controls exposed in the notification, such as seek backward and forward, play, pause, next track, and previous track. And for that, all you have to do is set up some action handlers so that when this action happens, you can take care of them. Now, if you have some custom media controls in your web page, you can make sure the state of your UI is reflected in the notification by overriding the playback state to playing or post. I personally really love this API because it is simple and powerful at the same time. 
Let me show you, for instance, some custom action handlers for seek backward and forward. This code is pretty simple to understand, right? These one-liner functions are only about controlling the current time property of a media element, and that's all. I'm sure you would love this feature in your favorite podcast web app. Now, here's another key part of a perfect media user experience, and we call it Rotate to Full Screen. As user rotates device in Netscape mode, let's be smart and automatically request full screen on the video to create an immersive experience. Note that video with no custom control get this for free, like Global Play, for instance. So how does that work? Let's use the Screen Notation Web API, which is sadly not yet supported everywhere and still prefixed in some browser at that time. Thus, this will be another progressive enhancement. As soon as you detect the Screen Notation changes, the video is full screen if the browser window is in landscape mode. If not, exit full screen. That's all. Eight lines of JavaScript, and all of a sudden, you can make the media user experience significantly better on the mobile web. What about out-of-focus media playback? When you detect your web page or video in your web page is not visible anymore, you may want to update your analytics to reflect this, or pick a different video track of a lower quality, post the video, or even show some always-on-top custom controls to the user. And to illustrate this, let me share with you two APIs you can use today. With the Page Visibility Web API, you can detect the current visibility of a page and be notified of visibility changes. This code simply pauses the video when the page is hidden. This happens when the lock screen is active, for instance, or when user switches tabs. As mobile browsers now offer controls outside of a browser to resume a paused video, I recommend you set this behavior only if user is allowed to play media in the background. And for info, when the page is hidden, video with no custom controls are automatically paused on Chrome for Android. With the new Intersection Observer API, you can be even more granular at no cost. This web API lets you know when an observed element enters or exits the browser viewport. In this code, the visibility of a small mute button is toggled based on the video visibility in the page. If the video is playing but not currently visible, the button will be shown in the corner of a page to give user control over video sign. Here's a tip for you. If you have lots of video in a page, and it is using an intersection observer to pause or mute off-screen video, you should consider resetting the video source to null instead, as this will release significant resources in an infinite scroll case. Whew, we've covered a lot. So, a great example of all these features is Vood.com, who has launched earlier this year a really cool media PWA. So please, welcome on stage Rajneel, who will share with us how it's gone and the future plans. Rajneel, the yours. Thank you, Francois. Hi, I'm Rajneel. I am the head of product and technology at Yco Meeting in India. Uh, we have had a great journey. We launched in May last year our OTT product, which is called Woot. Uh, today, we are at about 26 million monthly active users. And uh, everything they sp spoke about, about how to use the various APIs they've been releasing this year, we have been able to use it, and I think we have seen some significant improvement to a progressive app experience by itself. Uh, when we launched Woot uh, for the progressive web app, we actually called it Pro uh, Woot Lite, and that is a product that we are now focusing on extensively. The, the business metrics of what we have seen as an uptake has been phenomenal, but I want to share a little bit about why we thought it was important to make a progressive web app. India is a large com a country, and as we reached you know, the 26 million scale which we have reached right now, what we realized was that there were a lot of devices which were underpowered, they did not have enough money, uh, memory on them, and uh, they still wanted to access you know, the, vid the videos that they wanted to see. And we realized that one of the best ways to uh, do that was to be able to do something which did not require them to take space from their phones from an app, and that is where the progressive web app came in. One metric that I wanted to point out here was how our entire distribution across the web ecosystem has changed after we got the progressive web app on. It has gone from about 20% of daily actives to 50%. So that's a number we see that uh, has helped us get new traffic in, and obviously the marketing guys are really happy because the cost of acquisition has gone down. I will be speaking today about two different offline, uh, offline examples, but the first I want to speak about is the one that we're doing on progressive web app. India has about 1 billion phones, but only about 260 million 4G and 3G connections. 
Offline is a way of life for users to be able to access content and be able to play it later. Now, the internet access might be available to these users for various parts of the day, maybe at office, maybe when they are at a friend's place or a coffee shop. So we have taken the experience of offlining from the apps and really brought it to the browser. So user can set something to download, and when the download is complete, he gets a notification, and he can go off and be able to watch it at his leisure. How to, to explain a little about how we have achieved this, I would now like to call Arik from our, from our technology partner, Keltura. Thanks. Arik. Hi. My name is Eric Geisler. I'm the VP Technology at Kaltura. Kaltura is an end-to-end -end service provider for OTT experiences, powering large media companies such as Voot's, uh, Voot's OTT platform. At Kaltura Engineering, we basically have three pillars on which we measure our success. First off is performance, providing a top-notch performance across any device, across any platform for all of our customers' um, uh, users. Second is accessibility, providing our customers and users the power to access content wherever they are across any device, whether they're online or offline. And third, the user experience, providing a, providing a consistent, feature-rich feature -rich, uh, user experience for our customers across any device, across any platform. All of this while keeping in mind that most of our customers, such as Voot, require us to support premium-grade content, which usually requires some form of content protection. As such, PWA is a natural component for us to use to provide um, all three pillars. For instance, up until now, providing offline content support uh, for uh, content-protected content, for premium-grade content, usually required using a native application on top of ExoPlayer. By utilizing PWA capabilities, we can offer the same experiences using a simple web application, mobile web application. So now let's, let's look at a typical uh, download experience on a mobile web app. So first off, of course, the user will request uh, to download a specific piece of content from the web app. The web app, in turn, will go to the CDN or Origin, download uh, the respective uh, manifest. If the content needs to be content protection, there will be another request to the license server, providing information on the user, the content, the device, for the license server to make a decision regarding what kind of license to, uh, to provide for that specific piece of content. And now comes the interesting part where the application will pass on to the service worker basically a list of files uh, to download in the background. And the service worker, worker in turn will start downloading uh, these files from the CDN or origin while not blocking the application um, at all. Once this fetch is completed, a notification will go out to the application which in turn will, of course, notify the user that now the content is basically available for um, offline playback. So now let's look a little bit um, at some debugging tips and some um, experiences we've had along the way developing the PWA app. So first of all, keep in mind that if you check the bypass for network checkbox, this basically means that the fetch event on the service worker will be, sp will be skipped. It will not be invoked. Another thing to remember is update on reload is very good for development mode. It's very helpful. Just make sure to uncheck this when testing, of course. Specifically regarding background fetch, today you still need to use a flag. This flag is the experimental web platform features flag. Another thing to remember I and mean, to keep in mind while, while writing your code, and we'll see a snippet um, explaining this in the next slide, is basically if a single fetch listener fails, the rest will basically not be invoked. You need to keep this in mind while developing. Developing a progress bar is very easy, very simple. Basically, a, serv a service worker can update the application on its uh, progress within the app, basically telling the application how much of the content itself was actually downloaded already. So this, together with the total file size, basically, you can create your own progress bar, basically telling your users how much of the content was already downloaded. Now let's look at some code. The first snippet is basically um, the invocation of the background fetch fetch um, API. You can see a very simple uh, wrapper function. The first thing we do is we will insert into the index DB, the IDB, basically an entry representing that downloaded asset, that asset that is going to be downloaded. This will be used later on in case a service worker gets torn down or fails for any reason. Basically, we still have a record of that downloaded asset to re-invoke or to provide some uh, information to the user. 
The next call is basically the very simple invocation of the background fetch, fetch API, providing an ID and providing the list of assets, of course. This next snippet is basically, this is the event that gets fired out once the background fetch has finalized. This is the event. So first thing we'll do, of course, we'll retrieve the IndexedDB uh, metry that we just put in the, uh, that we just saw putting inside the IDB. Then we basically correlate that back to the background fetched assets in order to make sure that we're talking about the same assets. And the next step is basically putting the downloaded fetched asset into the cache. And this basically means that now the content is available for offline playback for the user. Basically, what will happen now after these uh, functions is basically the service worker will notify the application that the background fetch has finalized, has finished. The IndexedDB will be cleared of the entry that we no longer need, and the service worker will be cleaned up. You can see a very simple wor workflow for a very cool experience. Now I'd like to call back Reg Neal basically to talk to us a little bit about another very cool PWR experience for Root. Thanks. Now I want to tell a different story about offline. India is a large country, and we know that you know, there are about 1.3 billion people. One of the main challenges is that because of the geography, a lot of places still don't have stable 4G networks that people can really stream content from. The other challenge, of course, is that the data costs have been really high. Over the last year, the, the costs have come down with the launch of a new 4G network, but still data costs money. We looked at solving the problem in a different way. We said, what if we did not use internet to really get the content to the people? Maharashtra is a state which has about 112 million people, and we tied up with the state transport corporation there, and they have about 17,000 buses. What we looked at doing was launch a product called Wood Go. So uh, what you see here is essentially a bus station where, where you can sticker out and say log, log on to Wood Go. When you enter the bus, inside there are stickers telling the, the users to be able to access by typing Wood Go. What would happen is that they would find a Wi-Fi network, and we created these proprietary boxes which were placed inside the buses. These boxes can store about 200 hours of content and can be refreshed you know, uh, every time the bus goes back into the depot. And the users launch Wood Go. We customize the UI to make it extremely multilingual and easy to understand for people who might find English as a challenge, which, which is a lot of times. So we launch with two languages. One is in Hindi and another called Marathi. And we created a dedicated space for kids' content also in this. And when, today we are running this on about 10,000 buses. We have seen some amazing results. We have about 40 minutes of content consumption per user happening, and we see about nine users per, per trip connecting onto the platform and using it. What's cool thing about this is that when we reach scale of about 17,000 buses, we'll be servicing about 6.3 million people every day, 6.3 lakh people every day, which essentially means that we will be doing about 2.3 billion passengers will be coming onto the bus. Now, that's a large-scale deployment of a product to get content out, and this, of course, remains completely free for the users because this is advertising-driven. So what we're excited about is creating the best of internet in a, in a non-connected environment, being able to deliver content at scale, and creating a completely new business model for the media. So that's what I had to share about something that we're doing on Woodgo. With that, I'd like to call John back on stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rajneel. Well, as you can see, there are a lot of great opportunities out there for mobile web media, and we've listed some of the uh, key APIs on the screen right now. Um, for those of you taking pictures in the audience, those of you at home, hopefully this is a good reference for you. A couple of notes on the APIs. Background Fetch is still in development. It is available in Canary right now, aiming to release early next year. And as mentioned, it is something that you need to turn on the experimental web features flag if you want to try uh, using it. Offline persistent license support is in Chrome 62 for Android, and it's coming in Canary 64 soon for desktop as well. So if you're doing protected content offline, you'll need that feature. Uh, a couple of things we didn't mention in this talk, but also worth uh, looking at. If you want to send media to a television, please do look at the Cast API. It's easy to add to your site. And for anybody who has not yet seen HDR video, VP9 10-bit, uh, tomorrow at the demo pod, we will have that playing on an HDR screen so that you can actually see the future of some of the great video quality, both in terms of dynamic range as well as wide color gamut. So this is all coming. It's really exciting stuff. Ultimately, 
the web is more ready and more capable for media playback than even a year ago. And so it's been great for users, it's great for sites, uh, because it makes media just a single click or a URL away. We're excited to see continued growth in this area. So with that, thank you for your time. Uh, myself, Francois, will all be available uh, to take questions afterwards, and we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you.